Hello, my name is Sokari Prabo. I'm your physics teacher and we're looking at physics today. We'll be looking at part two of motion. In this part two, we'll be looking at cause and effects of motion. We'll also be looking at types of forces and finally we'll look at reducing friction. Let's now look at the cause and effect of motion. To bring a change in position, which is motion, of an object, there will be the need to apply either a push or a pull. When you push an object, it changes its position, or when you pull an object, it also will change its position. Now, the application of a push or a pull that will change or intends to change the state of rest or uniform motion of an object in a straight line, what is responsible for that is what we call a force. So a force is responsible for motion. And then it can be a push or it can be a pull. When that force is applied, what we will see is movement of an object. How? It changes its position or its direction from a state of rest of uniform motion in a straight line. We'll now look at types of forces. Now that we have known that a force is required for motion to take place. There are two types of forces. We have contact force and force field. We'll look at what each of these forces entails and some examples to go with them. Contact force. What is contact force? A contact force is a type of force that comes in contact or touch the body to which they are applied. So, a contact force will actually touch or come in contact to any body that they applied. For example, when you push an object, you have to come in contact with it and push it. And then when you pull an object, you have to hold it and pull it to yourself. So example of contact force is push, pull, tension, reaction, and frictional forces. All of these forces, you need to come in contact with the object on which the forces are applied to. Force field. In this type of force, there is no need for contact or touch of the body to which they are applied. Meaning, without coming in contact with the object to which they are applied, they can feel such a force. An example is magnetic force, gravitational force, and electrical or electrostatic force. Let's use the magnet as an example. When you keep a piece of iron metal close to a magnet, without the magnet coming in contact with the piece of metal, it will attract it to itself. Now, there is no contact. There is just a force field around the magnet which attracts the piece of iron material to itself. So that is how the force field is applied. Let's look at friction a product of motion. We will now be looking at reducing friction. Friction is a type of force which resists or oppose the force that is producing it. And that force is required to produce motion and friction resists or opposes that motion of the object. And it is relative to another while they are in contact. Let's use this picture here as an illustration to better understand how friction works. Let's take this top object as A and this to be a table. Let's call it B. Object A is on the surface of table B. We have a push force here moving this object in this direction. While friction, which is opposing or resisting this motion, will be moving opposite to the push force that is being applied to object A, thereby resisting 
the motion of object A. There are basically two types of solid friction. We have static or limiting friction and we have sliding kinetic or dynamic friction. What is static or limiting friction? Now, there is a maximum force that must be exceeded before a body can just start to move over another body. Now, for friction to take place, one body must slide against the other body. Like we have seen, a piece of object on top of a table sliding one against another. So before the object will slide over the other one, there will be need to overcome a maximum force. And that is where limiting or static friction comes into application. Next, sliding or kinetic or dynamic friction. This is a force that also needs to be overcome in this case to ensure that the body continues moving with a constant speed over another body. So this type of friction is applied to body already in motion. Now we're going to be looking at the laws that govern solid friction. Number one, we have talked about it and here is the first law we're going to be looking at that friction opposes the relative motion between two surfaces that are in contact and this friction acts in a direction that is opposite to that of the motion. Number two, friction depends on the nature of the surfaces that are in contact. Simply put, the type of friction you find when you have two rough surfaces in contact sliding one against the other is higher than the type of friction you get when you have two polished surfaces sliding one against the other. So that makes us to know that friction is dependent on the nature of the surfaces that are in contact. Number three, friction is independent of the area of the surfaces that are in contact. Simply put, if you have a large surface or if you have a smaller surface, it does not change the fact that friction will occur. It does not increase or reduce the amount of friction. It only tells us that friction will take place because these surfaces are in contact. So friction is independent of the area of the surfaces that are in contact. And then number four, the force of friction will increase to the same extent as the force which wants to start the motion or tends to start the motion. So the force of friction is proportional or increases to the same extent as at which the force that wants to bring about the motion. Number five law of solid friction states that the force or the frictional force is proportional and perpendicular to the normal force pressing the surfaces together. So, we have a mathematical expression here to explain that. The frictional force is proportional to the normal reaction force acting between or pressing the surfaces together. And when we take off our proportionality sign, we will have a constant. And this constant of proportionality, mu, is called the coefficient of friction. To better understand this fifth law of solid friction, let's look at this pictorial example. We have an object that is moving in this direction. It wants to slide in the direction P. And then we have the frictional force which needs to oppose this motion acting in this direction. The object, let's call it A, is on another object or on a surface, let's call it B. A has a mass and the weight of A can be calculated by the mass of A multiplied 
by the acceleration due to gravity. There is also another force acting in an opposite direction to the weight of the object, which is the normal force or normal reaction. And the normal reaction is always equal to the weight of the object in this particular case. So this law says this normal force is perpendicular to the frictional force and the normal force is the force that is pressing the two objects A and B together. This is the pictorial explanation for this fifth law of solid friction. Now let's look at the advantages of friction. How is friction beneficial to you and me? How is it useful in everyday life or in what we do? Number one, without friction, cars or moving objects will not be able to come to stop. And an example is the use of brakes in our cars to be able to stop our car when we come before an obstacle or when we want to collide with something. So friction is what enables our cars to come to a stop by the application of the brake. The brake makes contact with the tire and is able to make the tire to bring the car to a stop. Number two, screws and nails are able to be in place when we screw them in by reason of friction. So screws and nails coming into position when you screw them in or when you use an armor to put a nail in place, it's because of friction that they remain in place. Another advantage or usefulness of friction is that without friction, we will not be able to start working or to stop when we begin to work. So without friction, starting to work and stopping during working will be impossible. To start to work, there is a friction between your leg and the ground. And it is that opposition that enables you to move forward. And then, without friction, you won't be able to stop working. You will continue to work if there is no friction. But friction enables you to be able to stop working. And then next, friction enables automobile tires to make firm grip with the roadway to make them to be able to move, aiding movement. So without friction, automobile tires will not be able to make a firm grip. There will be a lot of skidding and moving off the road without friction. Next, we need friction to enable our knives and chisels to be sharpened at the grindstone. The grindstone has a rough surface. Friction can also be seen at display where our fan belts are put on the wheels or on pulleys in machinery. What keeps the fan belt in contact with pulleys and wheels in the machinery is because of friction. So it's utilized in that way. Let's now look at the disadvantages. Why is friction undesirable? Now friction is undesirable, one, because it causes heating of engines. Because of the opposition to motion, heat is usually generated in engines. And that heat is a result of friction between the parts of the engines when they move one against another. Another disadvantage of friction is that friction causes wear and tear in moving parts of machines. And this can bring the machines to a stop. When it has wear and tear, it can stop. I will need for repairs to be carried out on the machine. Another disadvantage of friction is that it produces noise, most times loud noise, irritating noise. And of course, noise or sound is a form of energy, so it's useful work coming out in the form of noise, thereby reducing the efficiency of whatever machine that is producing that sound. Still looking at the disadvantages of friction, much useless work is done by machines. Why? Because friction opposes motion. A machine will need to overcome, will generate energy to be able to what? overcome that friction, to be able to perform useful work. So before it performs useful work, it will need to what? produce excess or extra energy to be able to overcome 
friction before it can perform any work. Then, makes objects harder to move. When you want to push an object, the amount of force you apply is proportional to the friction that you receive between the object you want to push and the surface of the ground. So how can we reduce friction? How can we make our life more simpler by reducing friction? So we're going to be looking at methods of reducing friction. So the main ways of reducing friction, we're going to find out one after the other. Number one is that we can use lubricants like oil, grease, air, or even water as lubricants between surfaces that are in motion to reduce the amount of friction between them. Number two, we can use polished surfaces instead of rough surfaces. We can make the surfaces to be smoother to reduce friction. We have said that rough surfaces have greater friction between them when they are in contact than polished surfaces. So take, making an effort to ensure that the surface is smoother will reduce friction. And then ball bearings or roller bearings can be used. Like we have here, this is a ball bearing. This is an example of a bearing that can be used between two surfaces. In order of the surfaces to come in contact, if you put the bearing, it will enable them to move one against another, thereby reducing the friction between them. Methods of reducing friction. We can use a combination of surfaces, and that combination of surfaces are alloys. When you use alloys, the final product of an alloy can be an alloy of a low coefficient of friction when you're making sliding or moving parts. Another way we can reduce friction is by streamlining of the body of objects like you have in your aeroplane and jet fighters. Why? When you give them shapes that will allow air to flow easily, there will be less resistance in air. In this case, resistance that is friction. So, streamlining of the body of objects to give them shapes that will allow air flow easily without offering much resistance will help to reduce friction. So, what have we been looking at in this part two of motion? We have come up with the fact that force can either be a contact force or a force field and they can bring about motion. Contact force can be a push or a pull, and force field can be a magnetic field, gravitational field, or electric field. And we have said force can change the state of rest or uniform motion of a body. And then we said friction is that force which opposes the motion of an object. Now that we have looked at all this, let us try our hands on a simple question. A metal block of mass 5,000 grams lies on a rough horizontal platform. If a horizontal force of 8 newton just caused the block to slide, let us calculate the coefficient of limiting friction. Is it going to be A, 0.16, B, 0.63, C, 0.8, D, 1.6, or E, 2? So let's look at what we have learned earlier. Earlier we said F, the frictional force, is proportional to the normal reaction. And the normal reaction, R, is equal to the weight of the object, which is M times G. In this case, M is 500 grams. If we change 500 grams to kilogram, it's going to be 5 kilograms. And then we multiply it by G, which is 10 meters per second squared, a constant, and we will have the normal reaction as 50 newton. So how can we calculate the coefficient of limiting friction? The coefficient of limiting friction, nu, is now going to be F all over R. In this case, F is the force that is 
being applied, which is 8, all over the normal reaction, which is 50. And this is going to give us 0 0.16. So the answer is going to be A, which is the coefficient of limiting friction. So that brings us to the end of part two of motion. I hope you have enjoyed this session of our class today. Thank you and see you in our next class.